In this video, we're going to examine Newton's law of cooling. So the plan for the video is we're going to review the idea of temperature, introduce Newton's law of cooling, solve the associated differential equation, and then examine features of the general solution of this equation. So what is temperature? Well, roughly speaking, what you want to do is imagine that an object is made up of a bunch of molecules and they're jiggling about. And temperature turns out to be essentially a measure of the average kinetic energy of those molecules. So now what happens if you bring into contact a cold object and a hot object? Well, near the boundary, the faster moving particles will jostle the slower moving particles. And what will wind up happening is um, over the course of these random interactions, the speeds of these neighboring particles tend to equalize. And over time, what you find happening is that the kinetic energy tends to flow from the hotter object to the cooler object. So over time, the temperature of the hotter object will go down, temperature of the cooler object will go up, and they will tend to go towards some sort of equilibrium. We're going to consider a situation where we have a so-called thermal reservoir. So for instance, if we brought a hot object into this context, we're going to imagine that there's so many cool particles that there's really no hope of raising their temperature. We will only be seeing average kinetic energy sort of flowing out into the reservoir so that the object cools down. So here's a qualitative statement of Newton's law of cooling. The rate at which the temperature of an object changes is proportional to the difference of the temperature of the object and the ambient temperature. You may simply take this as a, an, an empirical statement about what happens when you actually measure the temperature of hot and cool objects as they're introduced into a thermal reservoir. What we're going to do is we're going to take this empirical observation, we're going to quantify it, arrive at a differential equation, and then by solving that differential equation, we'll be able to come up with a very detailed quantitative way of predicting temperatures of objects introduced into thermal reservoirs. So let's label some quantities. Let capital T be the temperature of an object. Little t is going to be the time. Capital A will be the ambient temperature of the thermal reservoir. Little k will be a constant that depends on the object that's cooling or heating up. And here's our statement. Now let's quantify this. The rate at which temperature changes is going to be the derivative of temperature with respect to time. And to say that it is proportional to something means that it is equal to a constant times the quantity. And that quantity is the difference of the temperature and the ambient temperature. Here's a differential equation which encodes Newton's law of cooling. Now let's talk about K. We can imagine, intuitively, that if we were to plot the horizontal line representing the ambient temperature and we were to take a hot object out of the oven, then the temperature is going to start at a, at a level that's greater than the ambient temperature and we would expect the object to, to cool off. Now what does this mean? It means that the derivative of the temperature with respect to time should always be negative. But we also know that the temperature of the object is actually greater than the ambient temperature, so this quantity is positive. What does that mean about k? Clearly, k has to be negative. Let's imagine now that we pull a cold object out of the refrigerator. The temperature of that object now starts lower than the ambient temperature, and we would expect the temperature to rise as it warms up to the ambient temperature. This means that the derivative of temperature with respect to time should be positive. In this case, T minus A is going to be negative. And what does that say about K? Once again, it says that K has to be negative. So any way you slice it, we expect this constant in this differential equation to be a negative number. Now, if you prefer your physical constants to be positive, well, there's a remedy for this. If we want the constant to be greater than zero, then we can simply introduce a minus sign here in the equation. And this does exactly the same job as before, but now we can uh, declare that our physical constant uh, that depends on the object should be positive. So let's use this second form instead of the first form for the rest of the video. 
Now this is a separable equation, so let's separate the variables and integrate. The integral of the left side is ln of absolute value of temperature minus ambient temperature, and the integral of the right side is simply negative kT plus a constant of integration. We're going to exponentiate both sides and recall a law of exponents that allows us to rewrite the right side this way, and then we're just going to put e to the constant out front. Now this quantity right here is e to the something, and therefore is some positive quantity. So let's just rewrite this. We'll call it c, e to the negative kt, and then notice that c must be positive. Now the absolute value bars are a little bit inconvenient, so let's drop those at the price of inserting a plus or minus on the right side. Now the thing to notice is so far, algebraically, this quantity on the right side can never be zero. It's e to the something times a non-zero constant. So apparently, if capital T of little t is a solution to this differential equation, then the quantity, capital T minus A, is either always positive or always negative. Now we're going to put a big, big asterisk here because this is a statement that only applies to a solution that comes about from the separation of variable process. We'll see that there's one other very special solution where this actually does not hold. So here's a slope field for our differential equation. And here's the line t equals a. So we'll notice that the graph of a solution either lies entirely above the line t equals a, which we saw was one possibility on the previous slide, or lies entirely below the line t equals a, the other possibility we saw previously. And you'll notice that there is something missing. There's the possibility that the line t equals a itself is a solution to this differential equation. And this is not a solution that shows up from separation of variables. It's easy to verify this truly is a solution because if t is the constant function with value capital A, then of course on the one hand the derivative of a constant function is zero for all t, and on the other hand this algebraic expression on the right side is obviously zero for all values of t, so this is in fact a solution. So let's go back to our algebraic um, derivation here, and we'll notice instead of demanding that c be a positive number and then we throw a plus or minus in front of it, we realize that really there's no restriction on c. We can just simply write t equals a plus c e to the kt, and c may be any real number, positive, negative, or zero. We could, if we wish, emphasize that this is providing the temperature, capital T, as a function of little t, the time, by writing it using functional notation this way. And now we ask the question, can we say anything more descriptive about this constant that shows up? So let's imagine that we find the temperature at time zero. E to the zero is one, so that's going to be a plus c. And we're going to introduce some notation. We'll let t subscript zero, called t naught. t naught will be the temperature at time zero. So you can think of this as the initial temperature. So the initial temperature is going to be the ambient temperature plus our constant C, which means the constant C we found can be also be thought of as the difference of the initial temperature and the ambient temperature. So this is probably a more useful way to think about this constant, and we'll substitute it back into our formula. So here it is, the general solution to Newton's law of cooling. Let's examine some things. If the initial temperature is the same as the ambient temperature, then this term is zero and you get the constant solution T equals A. We'll notice that since K is positive, E to the negative KT decays to zero as T approaches infinity. The implication then is that if we look at the limiting value of our temperature function, this term decays to zero and we're simply left with the ambient temperature. So the temperature of the object converges to the ambient temperature. This is, of course, something that should be uh, intuitively clear. When you pull an object out of the oven or the refrigerator, it either cools down or heats up to the ambient temperature over time. Of course, if the initial temperature is greater than the ambient temperature, then the temperature decreases asymptotically to the ambient temperature. And if the initial temperature is less than the ambient temperature, 
then the temperature increases asymptotically to the ambient temperature and we'll fill in our constant solution. So let's just recap. Here's the solution to Newton's law of cooling. Capital T is the general solution yielding the temperature of the object as a function of time t. T naught is the initial temperature, otherwise known as the temperature of the object at time t equals zero. A is the ambient temperature, a constant for the problem. It's the temperature of the surrounding thermal reservoir. And finally, K is the cooling constant, a positive number that depends on the object.